Well, good morning to you. I hope somebody will sit over here because the whole room will tip up and go that way in a minute if we don't be careful here. Thank you. I'm glad you, <laughs> I'm glad you got it under control. Ah, um, nobody has shorts on today. Yeah, that's good. Um, Christmas Eve day, I was wearing a T-shirt outside for Pete's sakes. You know? I'm hoping you're all are. off uh, on a good new year. Uh, I choose to say it's up, and that's my final answer, and I'm sticking to it. Um, we're going to have a good year this year. Um, you go with a, <laughs> you go into it with a positive attitude, and by golly, it's going to so, work. Would you take your bulletin, please, and turn to the back? We're turning over a new leaf this year, and we are going to start with the Apostles' Creed each Sunday. Uh, we're going to read this together. Uh, some of you are probably very familiar with this already, but uh, it's an awesome thing that Peter and I have talked about over the last year and a half or so that we think it's something that's very, very important to us as Christians. And so uh, let's look at the back of the bulletin and read the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Pray with me, will you? Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning on what outside is a chilly, chilly day, but on the inside right here with you, Father, it is a warm day. It is a beautiful day and one to look forward to. We invite you here, Father God, please uh, just cast your presence upon this place, as well as all of the churches in our city, our state, our country, that people will be hearing the word as you set it out to be read. Lord, we want to lift up all of the people in Boulder and in that area that are struggling right now. Father God, only you can bring comfort to this amount of people at the same time. Father God, smile upon them today that they would feel your presence, that they would feel the warmth of your smile on them, and they would look ahead to the future in, in some way to a positive future for them. They not only struggled with losing their homes and everything they own in a fire, but then to face snow. And I can only imagine, Father God, how they must feel now. So, Lord, we put them all into your hands, each and every one of them, from the youngest to the oldest, that you would watch over them now, that you would prepare them for the things that they need to be doing at this point in their life. But be with each and every one of them. We thank you for those people, the firefighters and the volunteers and the policemen and the paramedics. All of those people, Lord, we're just blessed that they were there to help with this fire. Lord, I pray over our city. I pray over our leaders that they would listen to your voice. That they would be comforted with your voice. Our world needs you, Father God. It just needs you so desperately. And having gone through this season of time every year where we stop and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, knowing where that birth will lead him, we are blessed beyond description, beyond our our 
small brain. So just be with us all, Father God. Keep people safe that are away from us today. Watch over them. Lift them up. And Lord, we pray over each of those individuals on the internet right now that are watching that you would bless this day for them. And Lord, we ask that you speak through John, Johnny in a mighty way today. Thank you for our little church and for what it means to each one of us. And we ask these things as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Would you Amen. take your Bibles, please? And turn to the book of Matthew back in the New Testament. And we are looking at Matthew chapter 10. We're going to start with verse 16 and read through 23. Listen to these words as we read them, huh? They're powerful and they're, and they're meant for us right now with what we're going through. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves. But beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues. And you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over... <laughs> Do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. And then if you will turn back into Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 22. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues and was praised by all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, 
today. This scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, Is this not Joseph's son? And may God add his blessing to the reading of Happy, his word. Happy New Year to you. It is so good to see you. Leave that vest here where you leave today, okay? It is so good to see you. Usually when you have a new year, people use the year to measure something in their life. Most people would do a resolution or something of that nature. And uh, my challenge to you this morning, if you already made a resolution last year, did you fulfill it? So, but, and don't make a new one if, <laughs> if you didn't take care of the other one. And, and years are just measurements is what they are. You know, I know the, the layers, uh, you know, celebrated their anniversary last month and, and they got a new young man in the house now. So things change. Things change. So it is with pleasure that I uh, bring to you chapter 26 uh, of the book of Acts. And as you begin to look at this particular chapter, now we have decided instead of giving you two different books each week, we're just going to finish out Acts. And, and the reason why Eases started in Acts is because we uh, were moved by the church being in the marketplace, the, the church today. And, and when Michael did such a great job of saying, listen to Matthew 10 very carefully as you hear it, that, that there's a mandate for the church today. In, and this sounds strange, doesn't it? 2022. Is that weird or what? Uh, Vic and I driving over here said when we were kids in junior high school, elementary, we didn't even think the earth would live that long for, you know, 2022. Can you believe that? And, and so as you, as you look at the church today and ask yourself the question uh, about what, what is God saying to the church today? As a matter of fact, if you, if, if you would take the word church out and not necessarily not use the word, but, but the question would be, what is the spirit is doing? And so when I begin to look at Acts 26, I had to ask myself three questions, and, and I would like for you to entertain those three questions because it's in those three questions that 26 will come to you. And, and the first thing is, is, what is it saying? What is Acts 26 saying today? And the second thing is, who is it talking to? Who is it talking to? And then the third thing is, how does it apply to my life? When, when I study, that's the, the, the premise by which I studied it. Oh, 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 okay, Luke, the Holy Spirit moved on you to write scripture, and something was pinned there. The 26th chapter has something to say to us, but we must go first ask that question, what is it saying? And so what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the first two or three verses, and then we're going to jump over into Luke, the fourth chapter, as well as Matthew 10, to, to say, what is the Spirit doing in the courtroom today? Uh, what is the Spirit doing in the courtroom today? I don't know how many cases there are before the Supreme Court. I, I, I don't know how many cases there are in Old Town, the courthouse, but, 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 but they happen every day. And the key is, what is the Spirit saying in the courtroom today? The place where you leave from what is called the battlefield to the courtroom, to, 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 to the spiritual legalities of the Christian faith. And, and, and the Holy Spirit seems to be saying, as I look at all these three verses, is that I still want my testimony in Congress. I still want my testimony in Fort Collins. I still want my testimony in every court case that goes on in our city. That the Holy Spirit's testimony doesn't stop because it's 2022. And that the language that you and I have has that language turned to what they're saying 
and CNN and, and, and Fox News or whatever, the language that goes across the news channels today, where is the testimony of the Holy Spirit? Because that was the language of then, and God wants it to be the language today. Because it's that language that changes mankind. It is that language that does something to the brain. It's that language that does something to the heart. And I believe he wants Christians to get back to that language, to get back to that language. That's why when you, you look at this, this, this title here, and it basically says the spirit in the courtroom, that spirit wants to be in government. That spirit wants to be in business. That spirit wants to be in education. That spirit wants to be in media and entertainment. That spirit wants to be in your home. So if it's in all those places, why not the courtroom of our nation? You know, who's, who's talking about the Holy Spirit in Congress? I mean, your, your prayer and my prayer should, should be, God, can, can somebody get to President Biden and share the gospel with the guy? Can somebody get to our senators and just share the gospel? That's it. Can somebody get to the House of Representatives to, you know, and just stand up and talk about Jesus Christ and him crucified? Ladies and gentlemen, you can talk about God all day and people won't even flinch. You mention the name of Jesus and you got a battle on your hands. So, so what is Acts 26 saying to us today? I had to ask that question before I started studying it. And so, so let's just read those, that, that those first three or four verses. And here's what it says. And we really did a good job of last week to, you know, you know, talk about, you know, Festus and getting to Agrippa. You know, it says, and Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul reached out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. He is in the tribunal. There is a king. There are governors. There are commanders there. People great, big, and small. And this, not only the Roman government there, but guess what? The Sanhedrin is represented there. Now, these are people who make policies. These are people who influence life. And yet God is saying, because we're in that setting doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit goes into the closet and hang out. Or the bathroom. Or he takes a break. So, so, so Paul gets a chance to share his defense. Now watch here, because what he's fulfilling is Acts 9, 15, when Ananias lays his hands on him, the Holy Spirit speaks through Ananias to Paul and says, you're going to be my witnesses, but at some point you're going to be in front of governors, watch this, and kings. At some point, do you think the Holy Spirit has limited your circle to just your family? Now you need to start there. But he has not limited your circles of just your family. He, he, he may choose to take you to the Colorado State Congress and, and be able to minister to Governor Paulus. So, 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 so this is what you see in chapter 26. And then he says, and, and now, now, now Paul begins to respond. And Paul says, in regard to all the things of which I uh, am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, fortunate, and that I am about to make my defense before you today. And he says, look here, and why am I, I'm so excited about this? Especially because you are an expert, and you're an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you, watch this, here's the third thing, listen to me carefully. Now, when Michael read Matthew 10, you know what he said? Listen carefully to what I'm about to read. Listen carefully to that. And, 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 and in some part of your day, I would like to encourage you to stop what you're doing. Get somewhere with your Bible and read it. Put your eyes on it and listen carefully to what it says. See, Paul knew what he was doing. He knew that 17 years later, he is actually fulfilling what was given to him 17 years prior. Now, what about you? 
Have you had a prophetic, you know, vision or has somebody laid hands on you one day and just said, hey, this is, this is what I sense God is saying to you. Will you take that before him? And then 20 years later, you actually see that come about. I mean, that, man, that's power there. And this guy is getting ready to fulfill that 17 years later. Now, now, now he, he says he's fortunate. He, he says you're an expert. He says, because I know what I'm about to tell you, you are not ignorant of, king. You're not. You've heard this before. And, and you know what? Will you take some time, king, Agrippa, to just listen to me? See? Now, if you will, if you would move with me over to the Luke 4 chapter, and I'd like to ask you a question that I asked myself about the church. It, this, this, this Luke 4 is telling me something about the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And no matter where the Holy Spirit goes, this testimony is going to come out. This is the question I ask myself. When I begin to read this, are these things happening? In my life. Not yours, mine. Is what I'm about to read taking place? Now, it says here that Jesus opened up the book of Isaiah. And I want to start with verse 18. And here's what he said. He says, first of all, the Spirit of God is upon me. Now, that word upon really means to be on in such a way that it covers. Not only does it cover, but he said, look at this. It has anointed me. That word anointed basically means to smear. Now, I know when uh, Jake and Canaan was taking care of little Judas at some point, all of you, whether you've had grandkids or children or whatever, there's nothing like the skin of a little baby. And one of the first products we bought a long time ago was called Johnson & Johnson baby oil. And it was no big thing to take that baby oil and rub it over that precious little body. That's what the word anointing is about. It's that Jesus says, I want you to understand something, that the Holy Spirit... Is not only upon me, but it has what? Smeared from my bottom of my feet all the way to the top of my head. And it has anointed me. It has granted me to do something. Now, let me say this to you. This is the identity of the church and the believer. Because Jesus was the first one to get it, and it remained. After him is something that we ask for and walk with every day. So listen to me. Whether you're in the courtroom, that anointing doesn't stop. Whether you're at school, that anointing doesn't stop. You're sitting in this room, that anointing is here. I mean, it's here. And Jesus is saying to us, look, I should be identified not by my side. I should not be identified about how many people who sit in the pew. I should not be identified by somehow some, some thing that somebody read. Man, I should be identified by the evidence and the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's how I should be identified as a church and as a believer. And then he said this, he says, look here, it, it has anointed me to do something. Watch this, to announce and proclaim public policy. To announce and proclaim economics. To, to announce and, and proclaim what's going on in the world. Or has it not anointed me to announce the good news? Because that's the only thing. Now, now y'all know this. Uh, we have a sin problem. 
And the only thing that's going to solve that problem is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only thing. Nothing else is going to solve that. No, nothing else is going to solve. No, 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 I want you to see these ingredients. What you and I should be marked by, and that gospel is to the poor. That's, that, that, that's not economics. That's poor in spirit. And then he says this, not only has he anointed me, but watch this. He has apostolic me, apostolos me, that word apostolos. To be honest with you, it's not even a biblical term. It's a natural term because the Romans used to send what? Representatives out to conquer a certain providence. You know what they called them? Apostles. Because they represented Rome. And when they represented Rome, they had what? The power of Rome behind them. Jesus said, I have been sent. In the gospel of John alone, the word sent is mentioned 37 times. That you and I are sent. We're just not saved, but we're sent. The Holy Spirit sent Paul into the tribunal. The Holy Spirit sent Paul to sit in front of the king. The Holy Spirit sent Paul to sit in front of the governor. The Holy Spirit has sent you to sit in front of Paulus, in front of the city council, in front of the mayor. He sent him. And if you're sent by Johnny, there's no power there. But if you're sent by the Holy Spirit, you got the kingdom of God behind you. Amen. Is anybody traveling with me this morning? So, so, so all I'm saying to you is this was not by accident. This was not by accident. So, so not only has he sent me, but, but watch what he sent me to do. Now, I'm going to ask you this question. I'm not defined by this. And I've been praying about that ever since I was restricted to my basement for 10 days. I've been praying about that because I'm not defined by this, and I should be. I'm not defined by a little big church. What I should be defined by are these attributes. Watch this. Here it is. To proclaim what? Release to captives. Johnny, when the last time you've been used by God to help release somebody from something that they've been captured by? Here's the second thing, okay? And to recover sight to the blind. I'm not just talking about physical seeing, but I'm talking about people who have been blinded just by life itself. I should be defined by that. And then he says to what? To set free those who have been what? Beat down. I should be defined by that. I wasn't even thinking about you when I did this study. I was thinking about me. Is that true of you? Because Jesus says when the Holy Spirit came, it came to do that. I mean, I mean I, look here, you are old enough and so am I to know that when you get up in the morning, you feel this snap, crack, or pop. <laughs> I, I, <Bang. laughs> I mean, you feel that. And, 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 and to have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and the King of Glory to step into your bedroom. And say, be released. Now, let me tell you something. That experience, you will be persuaded that he's real. You know, this is what the church should be defined by. Yes. Not by division. Not by a bunch of disagreements. Not by any of that. But when they talk about us, what do they talk about us? They talk about us separating. They talk about us doing all kinds of stuff. But they don't say, wait a minute, you know that church down the street, man? People are getting healed down there. People are getting set free down there. Cancer is gone. 
That's what Jesus came to do. And, and unfortunately, there are those of us today who think that that was just for them back then. Shame on us to think that somehow God just left that back in the first century. But that's not supposed to happen in 2020. Unfortunately, they we still got believers who don't think that this is the unadulterated God. That just runs me crazy. Because we think we got to add something to it. The devil don't have to worry about us. We spend too much time crucifying each other. We, we just do. So I asked myself that question. And so I, I, I looked at Luke 4 and I got on my knees. I'm just telling you, this message is not for you. This message is for me. Johnny, what about you? Don't go preach that to them and that's not happening in your life. Don't, don't, don't you sit up here and beat the church when it's not happening with you. So I looked at chapter 26 and I say, here's a guy who is a normal guy. He's no different than anybody else. And God so chose to use this man as an example to all of us of what's supposed to happen. And I'm saying, man, what about you? What about you? So I can't sit up here and talk about Peter or Michael or Rick. Where is that in your life? So the first thing I did was ask three questions to myself. And those first questions I asked is, where is my fishing hole? Where is the place that God has me? Well, he's going to have me at rack, at rack at least, at, 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 at rain tree workout at least once, three, four times a week. He's going to have me in front of a football team and a basketball team and a bunch of coaches. And every now and then he may have me down in Old Town. What am I doing with that? That was me. And where's this anointing? So I just started talking to people. You know what I found out? People are dying for truth. People are dying for truth. And they want to talk about it. And I'm sitting up here with a lady in Iraq two days ago. And I'm, I'm sweating. I'm ready to get to the next station. And all she wants to talk about is this Jesus dude. And I just asked her one question. So I said, man, don't sit up here and preach to this church if you're not willing to step out in evangelism. If you're not willing to say, it's Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, here's the second part of this, because we're going to finish chapter 26, because I want to show you how the scripture unfolds. Because you remember also when Michael looked at Matthew 10. Let's look at Matthew 10. Let's do this real quick. Rick and Julie left and it seemed like something happened. Let's pray right quick. Father, uh, whatever happened that they had to leave, will you take care of that? Will you bless them and give them power in Jesus' name? So in this 10th chapter of Matthew, I want you to see something here that uh, uh, startled me. I don't know how many years <laughs> I've studied this. Now, I had you read this a few weeks ago because you understood those first three or four things. Now, now listen to this. And this is what Michael said. Listen, bull, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, man, you're talking about wolf pack in our society. There's a whole bunch of wolves out there. Unfortunately, there's some of them in the church. Therefore, he says, look at here, I don't want you to be afraid, but what I want you to do is I want you to be, I just want you to be shrewd. Man, I want you to be equipped, okay, as a serpent. don't want you to be a snake, <laughs> but, but, but as crafty as they are, but I also want you to have no blood on your hands. I want you to be innocent. Now, now, that's not what we're going to land on today. It's going to be these latter verses. But beware of men who will deliver you up to courts and scourge you in their synagogue. Christians need to quit fighting against Christians. 
It's a bad testimony to the world. I mean, all you need to do is get a healthy dose of 1 Corinthians 6 and say, man, I would rather for that brother to wrong me than, 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 than to bring a lawsuit against him. I mean, isn't there somebody in the church wise enough to handle this thing? I mean, you, you just need to get a healthy dose of 1 Corinthians 6. Let's stop biting and gouging and beating each other. And, and he says, I want you to be aware of this. And then he says, and you shall even be brought before, here we go, governors and kings, <laughs> presidents and mayors and city councils. I don't remember the last time I've been brought before those people. I mean, uh, we have something called the Full Collins Church Network, and once a month, one of the pastors are assigned to go to this city council meeting to let the city council know that we're there to pray for them. You know, and, 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 and just developed a very special relationship with our, with our uh, city manager and our mayor and all of that. The, uh, all those people are new now. Uh, we have to build all that up again. But, but the beginning of each year, the Fort Collins Church Network brings those people in to hear their vision for the city and for us to pray for them to let them know that they got a whole pastoral network that cares about them. Amen. We've been doing that for 25 years. It's great. But I've yet to stand before those people because of my belief but because of something that they're doing that is totally against what the Bible says. Haven't gotten there yet. Don't mean it, it won't happen. But watch this, because I want to get back to chapter 26, and we'll read right through it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. The testimony of the Spirit in the courtroom. And, and then he says this, and he says, look here. He, he says, this is what I see that chapter 26 brought out to me in Scripture. He says, for my sake, watch this, as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Where is the testimony to President Biden? Where is the testimony to Congress, the House of Representatives, the Senate? Where is it? The Holy Spirit is saying, I'm still here, and I want to testify to them. Okay. And it says, but when they deliver you up, do not become anxious about how or what you will speak, for it will be given you in that hour to, to speak it. And I don't know how many times I have been nervous before certain people. And, and God is saying, Johnny, you didn't get that from me. <laughs> that didn't come from me, brother. Those people's feet were made out of the same clay as yours. So, so just because the governor is in the house, just because so-and-so is in the house, who told you to change? Who, who told you to do that? Oh, you respect those people and you love those people. Okay, now watch this, because this is the part that I don't think I realized until I sat down and began to let the scripture speak back to me. For it is not you who speaks, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now watch this. This is a part that I think the Christians today need to get a hold of. Watch this part. He says, and brother will deliver up brother. And let me tell you something. If my household is divided, I want it to be divided over the gospel. I want it to. Because that is something that Miss Square and I will not compromise on. And we won't do it for the sake of our kids, cousins, or whoever else. That will not change in my home. It just won't. So we're going to have division. It will be over the gospel. But see, we don't, we don't, we, 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 we don't embrace that in our families. Now, let me just say this to you. It's a death and a father uh, against a child, and a child will raise up against parents. See, I don't want my child to raise up against me because of personalities. But, but if there's a difference, it, it better be over the gospel, man. Because, uh, you know, John, who said this? Was Josh, Joshua who says, you can serve whatever God you want, but as for me and my household, 
Now, we're going to serve the Lord here. Now, you can go serve something out there. That will not live here. See, see, and this is something that Jesus is saying will happen. The gospel should be there to unite a household. But, 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 but when people start compromising for the sake of a wife, or compromising for the sake of a husband, or compromising for the sake of a grandchild, look out! Now, now, now we, most of us don't slow down and read this scripture. I don't want to be against my wife. I don't want to be against my son or my daughter or even my neighbor. But Jesus is saying, let me tell you something. When I come, I'm going to bring this sword. I'm going to bring it, man. See, I, I just want you to see what's happening. here. So your job is to raise and train your kids up. In the fear of the Lord. In the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not getting off the subject here. Now why are you thinking that I'm, why, why I'm in Matthew 10? Because Paul has to sit there in front of a king and fight against his own people. Did you get that? He has to sit there in front of a governor and fight against his own kinfolk. It's, it's tragic. That they have to go to Rome to solve a problem in the Jewish community. And if the Jews want to kill this dude, those are his brothers and sisters. Are you catching this? And he, his life is at stake. Because the people that he grew up with no longer want to have anything to do with him. Man, that is tragic. That is just tragic. So I'm, I'm sitting here reading this, and I'm going, wait a minute here. This guy's in the courtroom. And his sisters and his brothers want him dead. Man, if I'm you, I'll sit back and I'll push back from the table and I'll ponder that. Is it that bad? Is it that bad that we disagree so much and we want to annihilate each other? And the devil just sits back and folds his arms and goes, they will self-destruct. And yet, the testimony of the Holy Spirit is where that is his target to hit that. Where's the Holy Spirit? Where's the power of him? Think about that. So when I looked at Luke, the fourth chapter, and said, Johnny, these things should be defining you. Whether you're at rack, see you. Safe way, you should be defined by it. Hey, you need to watch out for that dude. Because when he comes around, man, it seems like he brings the kingdom with him. Or her. They're not saying that about the church today. I know they're not saying that about me. They're not. That's got to change for me. That's got to change. I grew up doing that. I grew up in a youth ministry doing that. I didn't know any better. I thought that's what all the Christians did. So watch this. Watch this Acts 26 now. Watch it. And see if you can't see Luke 4 and Matthew 10 express itself. Here we go. Getting ready to read it. Are, are, are you ready to go now? Because we, we're just going to go through it. We're just going to go through it. Okay. So, 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 so Paul, from verse 4 to 7, 
says something. I just, I'm just going to read it to you. And so then all Jews now know my manner of life from my youth up, which from, from the beginning was spent among your own nation, my own nation. Now that's Israel and at Jerusalem. Since they had known about me for a long time previously, if they are willing to testify, there's that word again, that I live as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect of our religion. And now I'm standing trial for the whole of the promise made to my made by God and our fathers. The promise to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve God night and day. For this hope, O King, I am being accused about the Jews. And look here, all he's saying is the Jews watch me grow up. They watch me grow up. You know what else they watch me do? They watch me be trained by Gamaliel. They watch me get trained in Phariseeism. They watch me get trained in Judaism. They saw me from a little boy till now. These are my people. These are my kinfolk. They saw it. Okay. Now it's, it's, it's unfortunate. He's got to do this in front of his own brethren. But, but, but he says also, I want you to know something. I stand before you because of a hope. You know what that hope and promise was? It was the hope of the kingdom to come. It was the hope of the resurrection. And it was the hope of the Messiah. They knew that was in their lineage. He says, man, that's what I'm here for. I'm not here to talk to you about the, late, the latest policy that was handed down by Congress. But I'm here to tell you about a hope and a promise that was given to me as a little kid. Uh, something that God has put into my DNA. That's what I'm here to talk about. Now watch this. He doesn't stop there. And then he makes a statement in verse 8. He says, and why is it considered incredible among you people? If God raises the dead, what God are you serving? Well, why is that an issue? If he is God, don't you think he can give somebody his life back? Now, don't you understand that power to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellow of his suffering and be conformed to his death? Don't you understand that's greater than Congress? Now, don't you understand that's greater than these policies that you're dealing with? Why is that so strange to you folk? So all he did was give what is called his pharisaical, pharisaical heritage. Now watch what he does next. Watch what he does next. Verse 9 through 11. We're going right through it. Now he says, look here, I want you to understand something. He says, so then I thought myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to get a heavy dose of John 16, 2 and 1 Timothy 1, 13. You know what it says? It says that there will be people out there who will persecute you thinking that they're doing God a favor. Man, we need to get rid of Johnny. We, we, we need to help God. You know what he says in these verses to come? He says this. I had to deal with this dead Nazarene. I had to come at him. Let me tell you something. You don't, you don't want to hear this. But there are people plotting against you right now simply because you're a believer. They are doing God a favor. We got to get rid of those dudes. I just tell them, wait, It'll, we'll be gone. We'll be gone. You don't have to worry about us. But here's what he said in these several verses. I locked them up. I beat them up. When it came down to them being sentenced to death, I approved of it. Man, I was so angry and mad. I even pursued these people to different cities. You know what else? I beat them up so bad I was forcing them to blaspheme, to say no 
to Jesus. I wanted to make the pain so bad that they would walk away from him. That's coming, ladies and gentlemen. That's coming. I had a lady in the wreck place the other day ask me, why aren't preachers preaching the book of Revelation? I said, well, I'll put that in the hopper because we're right in the middle of it. I had, a, I had a guy that, that, that asked me a question. He said, and we'll finish this, and I'm, i got to close this pretty soon here. He said, well, man, Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality. I go, which Bible have you read? And I said this. He, he made a statement about the end times. You know what he said? He said the end times become like the days, watch this, of Lot. Now, you got to go back and read Lot. And, 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 and you, you have to look at sodomites, sodomy, and, all, and how far as a nation and as a people that I have fallen to where I tolerate that which was intolerable back in those days. How far have I fallen? See, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about me. Me. So Paul is saying to this king, I was ignorantly doing something in unbelief. And then guess what happened? Here's what he said. Here it is. And while thus engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and the commission of the chief priest, those very guys that are in that corner over there, they gave me permission to do what I was doing. <laughs> And at midday, O oh king, I, I saw on the way uh, a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. He says, now all of us got this thing. He says, and when we had all fallen on the ground, I heard the voice saying to me in Hebrew dialect, Johnny, Johnny, stop it. <laughs> he said, you're persecuting me. It is hard for you to kick against the gold. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus who I am persecuting. This guy is in Congress. This guy is before the Supreme Court. <laughs> this guy is in the House of Representatives. This guy is in the Senate. And he's saying these things. He's talking about Jesus. Think about that. And then he goes, let me give you the details, man. He says, look. But he says, rise and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you. Watch this. A minister and a witness. He's talking to the king. Now, I want you to understand something. You don't talk like that in front of a king. Not only... He says, <coughs> sorry, not only the things which you have seen, but also the things which I have appeared to you, delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles whom I'm sending you. I'm not only going to send them to you to them, but I'm going to deliver you from them. Now watch this. To open their eyes. Notice Luke 4. You get it? Jesus says, Father, send me to deliver, so I send you to deliver. I send you because I was sent. Jesus says, I was sent, which makes me an apostle. Now I'm sending you. And then he says this, from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive what forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. And then he said, consequently, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision. Now, before we begin to close by, re by reading the remaining of these verses, this guy says, for 17 years, I have not been distracted. 17 years. 17 years. I didn't turn to the right. I didn't turn to the left. You know what I did? Damascus, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That's what happened. That's what happened. And then guess what? He says, man, I was, I was accosted by the Jews. They tried to kill me. And guess what happened? 
God rescued me. And not only did he rescue me, but I am here to tell you that the prophets and Moses said to our fathers that these things were going to happen and that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that light has now been shared to the Jews and the Gentiles. That was Paul's testimony. That should be your testimony today. That should be your testimony tomorrow. And now here's how this closes itself. Watch Festus. Now, I, I tell you what, they, they would have threw me out of the courtroom because I would have been laughing. Here, here, look here. Look, look what happens here. Just, just these last remaining verses before we close. And while Paul was saying this to his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you are stupid. You are crazy. This doesn't make sense. Now, think about that. Now, now, you're going to have to take some time to read 1 Corinthians, starting about the 18th verse in chapter 1, all the way to the 26th verse, and you will see the foolishness of the cross on the brain. It's called brain damage. I mean, look here, let me tell you something. One of these days, and like I said, I'm working on a message, and the message is called fried ice. It's impossible. It's impossible for ice to be fried and still be ice. And, and that's what the gospel message was to the human brain. It didn't make sense to the Gentile that God, a father, would do that to his son. It just didn't make sense. And it says it pleased the father to what? Pierce his son like that. That doesn't make sense. And, and then the Jews couldn't handle it. Because how in the world can a Messiah hang on a tree? How can a Messiah be cursed? It, and yet, let me say this to you. It is called the wisdom of God. You, I mean, you, you, you need to take 1 Corinthians, look at that first chapter, start with verse 18, and see that the gospel cross message is dumbfounding. That's why today, when we take communion, he says, no, don't you ever forget what happened. Don't ever forget that. And so how do we close this? Because what was he saying? He was saying that we should never lose the testimony of the Spirit. Who was he saying it to? You and I, the Gentiles, the Jews, and everybody in the courtroom. And it is not limited to your neighborhood. You bring that to the Supreme Court. You bring that to Congress. You bring that to the city council. You bring that to the governor. You bring it to the mayor. You bring it to the superintendent of schools. You bring that to the downtown business association. You bring that to families. Don't ever lose that testimony. Johnny. Johnny. And here's the last part. How does it apply? To your life. Watch these last few verses. Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, and I utter words of sober truth. For the king knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things escaped his notice. For this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa. Do you believe the prophets? I know you do. You see. And Agrippa replied to Paul, in a short time you will, here we go, persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul says, I would to God that whether in a short or long time, not only you, but all who were, hear me this day, might become such as I am except for these chain. Now, when I was in the workout place this week, I just started having to talk to people and 
you know, Sean knows what I'm talking about. We, we're in there. I see Sean in there from time to time. And God just says, look around you, Johnny. Now, I'm not saying you need to stop everybody from working out and start preaching in the rack. I'm not saying that. But, but, but are you sensitive enough that this man right next to you, are you willing just to say, hello, how you doing? I started doing that. Five people I've ministered to. One of them has showed up here a couple of times, Clyde. There's going to be another that shows up here, a guy with a dog. Because God just says, say it. Say it. And then watch me work. That's all he's doing. Say it. And all Paul did was say it to the king. Paul, you, you slick buddy. <laughs> and at the end of this thing, as we get ready for communion here, the word says that when Agrippa, Festus, and the commanders stepped back and they concluded something, you know what they concluded? The guy could have went home free. Because he didn't do anything that was worthy of death. All Paul was communicating is that Christianity should not be a threat to the government. And it shouldn't be a threat to anybody. That's all he was saying. Christianity here is to help man reach the fullness of who he is. Christianity is here to help us become what God intended us to be before the foundation of the world. Amen. That's all it is. And that's all we have to just share. And, and so in closing, when you go through something like this, and I'll just set you up for next week, this guy's got to go to Rome now. He didn't have to, but and all he had to do was just share his testimony and leave. But you know what he did? He appealed to Caesar. And they're saying if he never appealed to Caesar, we'd let him go. Because there was nothing he did wrong. But guess what? The Holy Spirit wanted him to get in front of Nero and the boys. Think about that. <laughs> so next week we talk about this, having the Holy Spirit be involved in your travel plans. <laughs> him who never fails. Isn't that great? All the glory. And let the communion, Mike did a great job, just be with you as you leave this morning. Father, we, we thank you, and there is no other name above that name except the name of Jesus himself. And from one church to the next, from one generation to the next, his name is Jesus. He never fails. And everybody said, amen. 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 Bless me, the time that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred mind is like to that at Oh, in grace. There we go. Have a great week, you guys. God bless you.